When it comes to horror games, few have executed their concept as flawlessly as this 2008 powerhouse. Stepping into this title is one of the single best experiences you can find on offer from the seventh generation of video gaming. It's arguably the best seventh generation horror action game out there, and definitely among the best games overall. So what the hell is it? Although many have described it as Resident Evil 4 in space, including members of the original development team, I'm going to be refraining from comparisons as much as I can throughout this video. That being said, Dead Space is, as mentioned earlier, a horror action game released on the Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, and Microsoft Windows in October of 2008. It was developed by a younger studio with only a few prior titles under their belt, EA Redwood Shores, and published by EA Games. Whatever was going on over at EA to compel them into funding a wholly original AAA budget horror game from a dev team that had only ever made licensed titles before is beyond me, because that type of move is pretty contrary to everything I've ever seen EA Games do. But it happened. And what came next was a surprise hit out of nowhere, at least critically. Dead Space received mostly positive reviews across the board, being praised by critics left and right. It wasn't getting any 10 out of 10s, but it was raking in 8s and 9s and won 13 different awards. Not to mention a strong cult following was forming just under the surface every passing day. Sales-wise, however, Dead Space was struggling to meet expectations and would unfortunately be considered a financial disappointment by the executives at EA Games. When all was said and done, the game sold over a million copies across its three major platforms. I mean, it was a brand new IP, however, and despite its mildly disappointing sales, it was very well received critically, and most importantly, it had developed a massive cult following. So, I think the developers should be proud of their work. Speaking of, let's talk about the developers a little bit. EA Redwood Shores. Who, you may be asking? Well, you probably know them as Visceral Games, and they are indeed, or rather were, one in the same studio. Visceral was initially founded under the name EA Redwood Shores before changing their studio name to Visceral Games after they became what's called a genre studio essentially meaning that they would specialize in a specific type of video game genre. Their first game under the name Visceral would be Dante's Inferno, a game which I've already done an extensive retrospective of here on the channel, and I'll link to it up at the top of the video. For the duration of their development on Dead Space, however, they were known under the aforementioned EA Redwood Shores. So how was Dead Space's development? Well, like any project with this much passion behind it, difficult. Dead Space was an idea floated around within the offices of EA Redwood for years before they actually started working on it. Although it wasn't called Dead Space at the time, but rather it was referred to as Rancid Moon. The brainchild of Glenn Schofield, Rancid Moon was intended to be, as he put it, the most frightening horror game possible. Here is a poster from Dead Space itself advertising the title as an in-universe movie. If this poster seems familiar to you for some reason, it's because it's literally the Callisto Protocol. Yeah, the idea of a game taking place on a prison colony built on a moon was the original idea for Dead Space all the way back in the early 2000s. Schofield simply recycled the idea for the Callisto Protocol. And we even see the little collar thing on the main character's neck like in the Callisto Protocol, serving as indirect marketing for a game that wouldn't exist for a decade plus. As for Dead Space, the team took notable influence from two particular monolith franchises at the time, Resident Evil and Silent Hill. Combining different elements of those games, they created a prototype for Rancid Moon on the original Xbox. Man, that sounds so cool. A Dead Space prototype made on original Xbox hardware. I would love to see that if it's still out there somewhere. Well, this prototype was enough to convince some executives at EA Games to greenlight the passion project, and they were given two years to create the game, which of course was developed for 7th generation consoles. It was during this time that the name was changed from Rancid Moon to what is now known as Dead Space. I mentioned earlier that the game took inspiration from Resident Evil and Silent Hill, but this was after they had begun pursuing the project in full. It is worth noting that the ideas for Rancid Moon existed for years before this and were originally even considered for a third entry into the System Shock series. However, after Resident Evil 4 released, it changed everything about where the project was heading. 
remolding it into an original IP with a more action tilt. As development ensued in earnest, the team allegedly spent three months developing a prototype cooperative mechanic for the game, where two people would play through the campaign together. But this mechanic was cut after that three month period to focus on the single player experience. Those familiar with the franchise will understand why this is relevant. Development of the game was actually halted for nearly a month over one specific instance during the game where Isaac is grabbed by a massive tentacle and dragged down a hallway. This was a problem that was so big and so hairy for us that it just it kind of stopped us in our tracks for a month. I went away for a few days on, on business trip. When I came back, nothing was working, um, but yet all the stuff was there, right? And it was done right, it was done good. But they're like, Glenn, we did everything you asked, but it's a mess. And I'm looking at it going, yeah, it is, you know, it is. After just kind of making a whole bunch of mistakes for a couple of weeks, we realized there's gotta be a better way. And I realized that, you know, the problem wasn't the team, it was really on how I was giving them their assignment. Some things need to come first. I need to have them grab them by the leg before I can throw them on the ground. And he needs to be on the ground before I can start animating. So all these things then started coming in as layers. The sequence is iconic to the game now, but was apparently incredibly hard for the team to make function, taking the entire staff roughly a month to get working correctly. Eventually, of course, the team overcame that obstacle, development continued, and Dead Space was eventually finished and released to the public. Before I get into talking about the game, I need to address what kind of an underdog situation Dead Space really was. Up to this point, EA Redwood Shores only ever developed licensed games like The Godfather. They were not a studio taken seriously or held with any reverence by the community of consumers or publishers. On top of that, the company they needed to convince to greenlight their risky passion project IP was EA Games, among the most notoriously greedy and soulless of any game publisher out there. The odds were stacked against this team, and they managed to pull off a series of unlikely events to even get this game made. And that unlikely game released to become what I would consider one of the best action horror games ever made. Okay, I know I have a habit of talking a lot about how the games I choose to cover are meaningful to me personally in some way. Halo, Metal Gear Solid, Star Wars, I mean, if you're going to spend dozens of hours creating content about something, it helps if you're passionate. Dead Space for me, however, is different. It's more than special to me because it was one of the most impactful games of my life. I remember it vividly. 2009. It must have been March or April, and I'll say why in a second. I was 13. Now, I grew up over 30 minutes from the nearest store that sold any type of video game, so it wasn't exactly super easy for me to get my hands on these things. I still remember the day I got Dead Space, though. I had saved up roughly $65 for a new game and talked my brother into driving us out to a Walmart. It was one we never went to, which is why I probably remember it, because it was the other direction from the one we normally drove to. Now, the reason I know it had to have been March or April is because when we went there to get a new game, I saw two that I wanted sitting side by side, locked behind that glass case. One was Resident Evil 5 and the other was Dead Space. Both were about $60. Since RE5 was there and at full price, I know it must have been around March or April and I know it wasn't summer yet. I took a minute to decide, but something about that dismembered hand just floating in space was calling to me. So I chose that one. Now at this point, I had not played many horror games. Call of Duty, Halo, stuff like that was what I was normally into, so this game was something else to me. After I started playing it, it opened a new realm of what I thought stories were capable of being. Gruesome and unashamed to show the player the more brutal nature of death and corruption. I was, for lack of a better word, obsessed. So with all that said, I think it's time to actually dive into this game and see what Dead Space has to offer in full. Welcome to the channel, and I hope you enjoy my extensive retrospective of Dead Space.
Before we talk about the chapters, let's look at this main menu. Man, what a beautiful and well-designed opening menu. The music is uninviting, the sound design is unsettling, the background is a mix of schizo horror and science fiction. I love everything about it. Getting into the game, there are 12 chapters that comprise the full narrative of Dead Space, and each of these chapters is separated by a distinct ending via using the ship's onboard tram transit system. So every time you board the tram to take you to a different part of the ship, you know the chapter has ended, with some notable exceptions. The game's opening is, for lack of a better word, stunning. A video of a woman talking remorsefully about something before it's cut off from the static and our character is revealed. I, it's me. I wish I could talk to you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry about everything. I wish I could just talk to someone. It's all falling apart here. I can't believe what's happening. It's strange. Such a little thing. He's sitting in the passenger seat of a shuttle, and there's other people on board with him. They call him Isaac, and that's who we play as. Isaac Clark, engineer for the CEC, meaning Concordance Extraction Corporation. He's an engineer tagging along on this mission with Kendra Daniels and Zach Hammond. Kendra is a technologist, and Hammond is a security officer. With them are two other security officers as well. Their names are Corporals Chin and Johnston, but that really doesn't matter. Communications have gone dark aboard the USG Ishimura, and this little team is coming out to aid in repairs. After all, how bad could the situation be? Let's go back to that opening of the woman talking. What a great opening to a game, first of all. But second, that's Nicole Brennan, Isaac's girlfriend, and the main reason he volunteered to come along on this repair mission. That transmission was sent to him from her before contact was lost with the Ishimura, and it's the last thing Isaac has from her. Now is a good time to talk about Nicole's character. Nicole plays a massive role in Dead Space 1 and 2, and also makes appearances in Dead Space Extraction, the spinoff game, the comics, and the animated movie Dead Space Downfall. So, being such a crucial character, you've got to get the casting right, and they did. Embodying Nicole Brennan is Liari Limon, I hope I pronounced that right, who really nails the character's soft yet stoic demeanor, which makes it so bizarre that they'd recast her in both the sequel and remake with someone else. But I'll talk all about her and every character in depth in a later section. I just wanted to touch on it here since it's the opening and it's so important to the first level of the game, her character's the first thing you see and hear, and Nicole is Isaac's main motivation. As we were approaching the Ishimura in what I can only refer to as a breathtaking opening sequence, things go terribly wrong as they are wont to do in horror titles. The shuttle isn't able to engage magnetic locks for docking procedures, and so we crash straight into the hangar of the Ishimura. One needs fixing. Gravity tethers engaged, automatic docking procedures are go. What the hell? Sir, the auto dock. What is it? We're off track. We're gonna hit the hole. Hit the blast shields. That guidance tether is damaged. Switch to manual, now. Inside the magnetic field? Are you insane? Abort! No! We can make it inside. Corporal, I gave you an order. Field too strong! We've fallen down the rabbit hole. Welcome to the USG Ishimura. Above the catwalk upon which we walk, we can see a massive screen showcasing a visitor's welcome video talking about what the USG Ishimura does as a planet-cracking vessel for the Concordance Extraction Corporation. It's really a brilliant way to introduce the player to the world they've entered while feeling natural and not overly expositional. This little welcome lounge is fantastic too. Look at it, inviting and surprisingly clean, unlike the rest of the ship. This is where the game goes off the rails, so to speak. Isaac ends up getting separated into another room where he restores emergency power to the lounge, and then, well, we watch half our crew get ripped to pieces by monsters that leap out of the vents. What the hell was that? Automatic quarantine must have tripped when the filtration system restarted. Everybody relax. What was that? Did Not sure. What the hell? I don't know, something's in the room with us. 
Jesus! Over fire! Over fire! Tender power! Tender! Come on! Come on! Got it! Isaac! Get the hell out of there! The door's unlocked! Run! R.I.P. Corporals Chin and Johnston. As we sprint down the hallway being chased by whatever these monsters are, I have to say this game did not waste any of our time. I mean, look at this sequence. That is how you do an opening. From here, we're given control of Isaac for the rest of the game. The ship we're on is currently in bad shape. It's floating derelict and half of the ship's systems aren't even running with the other half fading fast. Before we can run around repairing everything, Isaac needs to fix the ship's tram system. It's the only way to get across the massive mile and a half long vessel. So that's our quest. The game has introduced us to almost everything, but there's a few final things we are shown to set up for the rest of the game here in this first chapter. On our way to remove the broken tram from the railing system, we pick up a stasis module. I'll talk in depth about this in a later section of the video, but just know it slows whatever it touches down, including this door currently blocking our path. On easier difficulties, this tool feels like a little bit of a gimmick. On hard difficulty though, it's an invaluable tool without which the game would be nearly impossible. Each chapter in the game makes sure to have Isaac interacting with different parts of the ship in some way. Unlike many games, Dead Space isn't just exploring through a level while shooting things between you and an exit. There are things you have to literally do in each level and the enemies are just obstacles. The goal of Dead Space isn't kill all the monsters, it's repair the ship and uncover the mystery. We get our first taste of this gameplay loop when we arrive at the broken tram. There it sits. In most games, we'd click a button and leave. Not this game. We have to manually attach each arm to pull the tram in, only to discover that one of them is busted and won't attach correctly. This requires that we use our stasis module to freeze the busted arm in place long enough for it to forcibly attach. After this, we can pull the broken tram in to move it out of the way. And of course, our monstrous friends attack as soon as they hear the commotion. We're not done yet though. The tram system itself is missing a data board that allows it to run. Why is it missing the data board? Well, someone removed it. Why would someone remove the tram system data board and haul it away to an office? It's almost like someone wanted to make it harder to access the tram. Why would anyone want that? Well, not only did they stuff the data board in a storage room, they locked it and hid the key in an office, meaning Isaac has to find the key to then access the storage room and retrieve the data board and finally reinsert it into the tram system. Voila, trams are back up and running again. We can now travel around the Ishimura with ease. This opening level has successfully introduced us to almost every major mechanic in the game, established a precedent for the gameplay loop, introduced the persisting atmosphere, and created a tone for the narrative. If it seems like I'm gushing, it's because I am. This first level is a masterclass for how to open your video game. If you're an up-and-coming developer studio, I recommend studying this game in depth. With all of that settled, we head back to the tram to leak up with Kendra and Hammond, who tell us to try to prep the Kellyan for launch. That's the shuttle we arrived on. Hammond isn't keen on remaining here very much longer, so Isaac heads back to the Kellyan and starts to make preparations. like we're not going anywhere now, and as for the Ishimura, it's in bad shape, and there's nothing Hammond or Kendra can do since the whole ship is under an executive lockdown. The only way to lift it is with the ship captain Benjamin Matthias's authorization codes, whose last reported location was the medical facility. 
With options running out by the minute, Isaac reinforces his engineering suit with extra plating, boards the now functioning tram, and heads to the medical facility to find Captain Matthias. Something is very wrong here. Obviously, we knew the crew was under attack from some kind of creatures, and the ship's condition was worsening. That's not what I mean. I mean, our first interaction with a living member of the crew shows us she's gone completely insane. Under the current circumstances, it could be assumed that high stress may cause such symptoms, but given what we know about the creatures we've encountered, they're not taking prisoners, they're out for blood which means they didn't remove her eyes like that or patch them. Someone else did that, someone human. Back to the gameplay, she gives Isaac something, another tool for our arsenal, a kinesis module. This tool is pretty crucial to the game's non-combat mechanics, but can be used in combat situations as well. Although not as necessary as the stasis, it allows us to pick up items and throw them without ever touching them, almost like a magnetic tractor beam or something. We use this to clear the crates blocking our path and proceed towards the moor. Only one problem. It's been barricaded by massive chunks of metal and welded together. Our kinesis module won't be enough to get through that. Isaac, are you there? We were attacked. Kendra's gone. One minute she was there, and I, I can't believe I lost her. We can still do this. Get me the captain's rig codes and we'll find Nicole. Looks like the crew barricaded the door to the emergency wing. You have to blow through it to get to the morgue. Get some thermite from medical storage and a shock pad from zero G therapy. Should be down the corridor. Communication is useless in all this static. You know, it's pretty lucky someone thought to log in the ship's systems where there's thermite actually. But first, we're going to need a shock pad to utilize it. These things are in medical storage and zero G therapy, respectively. Do you hear that? Okay, like I said, there's something wrong here. This is the diagnostics wing, and they were doing something here that isn't planet cracking. What was really going on in this ship? Studying corpses? Maybe there's answers in this office. Nope, doesn't seem so. Moving on this hallway has an entire chunk blown out and we can see the planet below through space. This is where we get to the first zero gravity area, and it's fun to toy around with, especially since this is the only game in the franchise that handles zero G like this. It's cool, very unique. Isaac is a space engineer, so he knows how to hop around a zero gravity environment. We get the shock pad, and now all we need is the thermite. Where was that again? All right, medical lab. Hazardous anomaly detected. Quarantine activated. So the medical lab has a problem? We have to... Oh man, glad that's over. Yeah, this game manages to provide a very isolating environment. It's very good at making you feel alone, like you're the last living thing with the- Hey look, a living person. I don't know how I'm going to handle this without getting demonetized. Okay, so because this ship is out in space for months and even years at a time, sometimes women end up pregnant and have to give birth. 
Those infants are then kept stored in pods where they are maintained. Well, the things turning everyone into monsters are very diversity-minded and consider these... <laughs> consider themselves equal opportunity hires regardless of race, sex, or age. Even if you're an infant, you're still getting denecrotized. And Isaac has to game into these creatures, often. Isaac better be reciting some kind of stoicism mantras under that helmet. Around this corner is the main lab, and our thermite which we grab and sprint back to the main lobby. Bye bye barricade. All we have to do now is reach the captain, grab the data from his rig, and we're good to go. Easy enough. This is senior medical officer Nicole Brennan transmitting ship wide. We need more help. We don't have the resources to deal with this many cases. Nobody would tell us what's happening. These wounds, we are not equipped to deal with this. Get up to the table! Hold him! Nurse, you hold him down! Every quarter. Well, Isaac's girlfriend, Nicole, was holding down the fort. Looks like the waiting lobby for the medical bay has some schizo posting going on. Look, another living person. What is she doing? <laughs> Can I show this on YouTube? <laughs> Why is it that every time I meet someone new, they always do that? Playing this game is sort of like a carnival ride house of horrors. Around every corner is something insane happening. Literally. Ah, finally, there's the captain. Now let's just... I know I can't be showing that on YouTube. And that's pretty much it for chapter two. Hammond calls us to let us know the good news, that our engines are offline and we're slowly sinking towards the planet which we will eventually get fully trapped into the gravity pull and crash into. So, our next stop is the engineering deck to try and get those engines back on and buy us some time to get this situation under control. You've got two problems, and we're working on borrowed time here. First, there's no fuel in the engines. Second, the gravity centrifuge is offline, which means there's a couple of trillion tons of rock pulling us down. I need you to get that centrifuge operational. Refuel the main engine and fire it up so I can stabilize the ship's orbit. Okay, so this ship, being a planet cracker, functions by utilizing lasers and gravity tethers to literally rip a small continent chunk size of the planet out of place and hold it in the air as miners go in and gather resources. However, since our gravity centrifuge isn't spinning, that trillion ton rock is slowly about to start pulling us toward the surface. And since our engines aren't on, we are doing very little to combat that inevitable crashing demise. So here we are on the engineering deck to reactivate the gravity centrifuge and the ship's engines. That should at least stabilize the ship long enough to figure a way out of it. Surprisingly, there's not a person here trying to game into themselves or say something spooky like last level just this control room engineer on his break. This level's architecture ups the atmosphere by a lot. I don't know why, but this level is significantly scarier with its graded design everywhere than the medical bay was. There's less scripted events in this level than the last, but the ones we get are big. I love the massive open feeling of these catwalks surrounded by the empty void of the Ishimura's interior. Going to this from the medical bay where everything was so claustrophobic is just good game design. We can see this massive thing in the ambient darkness as we cross, but we aren't sure what it is just yet. And we actually get a chance to use our kinesis more here in a way that interacts with the environment. In order to get across to where we need to go, we've got to get the trolley over here, but it's suspended out there and we can't reach it. 
so we use Kinesis to pull it to us and then use Kinesis to start the power. This feels so visceral and real to the universe, man. I love how they handled pretty much everything in this game. And waiting for us on the other side of this gondola ride are the welcome party. We don't have to stay in this little area long, just need to initiate the power on this side and... Refueling sequence activated. Sufficient fuel to fire primary engine. Bingo. Whatever you did, it's working, Isaac. I have a fuel reading. It's only a quarter full, but that's enough to restore orbit once you bring the engines online. What the hell? Oh, false alarm. I thought I saw something. We have now activated the refueling sequence. Can't run engines without fuel. Okay, we now make our way back into the main lobby and see the engineer on his brake clocked back in. And we're on our way to reactivate the gravity centrifuge. I see. Decontamination sequence complete. Thank you for your patience. Well, this is an ominous hallway. Entering zero gravity. Good to be back in zero gravity. And that thing there is the gravity centrifuge. We've got to reattach those spinning things to the main centrifuge, which is going to require stasis and kinesis. I love this game's progression! Once it's back online, gravity is restored and the lower level below the centrifuge opens up into space. So artificial gravity comes online, but oxygen is now gone. All we have to do is make our way around, back to the other side of the room, past the giant spinning hunk of metal. Since the regular pathway was blocked by some kind of organic growth. And that thing had to learn the hard way. Finally getting across that, exiting the vacuum, and hey, we're safe again. Now it grabs you, and that moment, just when it grabs you, I want it to be one of the scariest moments in the game. Because it flips you on your back. And you can't get away from it. You have to shoot it through. We've still got the engine situation happening, which we need to go back and resolve. So back into the vacuum we go, and without oxygen. Make it quick, because there are some angry creatures out there. Nearly there, all we need is... Getting through that, we enter the flesh chamber. Everything about this room is disturbing. There's organic growth everywhere, torsos attached to the walls screaming in pain. This guy. It's an absolute madhouse in here. Finally though, there's the engine room. We're home free. So this basically turns into a horde mode style area because after clearing these things out, I'm going to activate the ship's engines and when I do, they will come. It's working. We're online and functional. Finally, some good news. Get a tram to the bridge, Isaac. I'm gonna take us back into a gym station. Wait, wait, we're not safe yet. The ship's asteroid defense system is offline. On the way up, the ship's going to pass through a debris field thrown up from the planet crack. We'll be ripped to pieces unless you restart us. God damn it. I'll start working on it from here. Isaac, meet me at the bridge. You can do more good here than I can. Where are you? It's me, Nicole. Well, at least Nicole is alive, and she just contacted us. This is great news. Except for the ship soaring straight for an asteroid field now that the engines are online. Either way, we need to meet Hammond on the bridge and figure out our next move. Isaac, 
Come in. Kendra's right. The ADS is completely shot. I'll need your help to fix this. Kendra, if you can hear me, see if you can get to the ship's reports. It sounds like you have better access from there. When were you going to tell us about the artifact, Hammond? This marker? I don't know anything about that. It's referenced in the captain's records. They brought it up from the planet. It's on the ship? In cargo. They think it's of alien origin, but I don't know what the hell it is. Really? CEC didn't know anything about it. You're lying. Back off! I am not the bad guy here. We're all shaky right now. You're gonna have to trust that I don't know anything about it. <laughs> We've entered the debris field. Get to the captain's nest. I'll explain everything later. Hammer down. We're in chapter four now, and let me tell you, this game doesn't give you a break. Pretty much the only potential and incredibly subjective criticism you could make about this game is that it is so scripted, but that's entirely up to taste, and I think it lends itself to the haunted house vibe very well. Ah, the bridge atrium. Okay, we have work to do. First things first, we need to go see Hammond and figure out the status of the asteroid defense systems. He's in the cockpit trying to figure out what is even going on. When he tells us that he can fix the boards in the cockpit, but the main power routing has been shut down. So it's up to Isaac to reroute the power manually, which means going to every floor accessible from the bridge, which requires the elevators, which are currently shut down. So before we can do anything, we need to get the power back to the atrium elevators. By the way, Isaac, be careful. I saw something out there. I don't know what. I only got a glimpse. But it was big. Really big. Ominous! Alright, let's get back to the bridge security station and get this situation sorted. Shit! Stand back! Better get moving. Oh, that one was dead when I sealed the pod. These things don't die easily. That was dramatic. Okay, as I was saying, the bridge security room should be right beside the entrance we initially entered from. Well, they're getting bigger. After dealing with that, we access the bridge security and re-engage power to the atrium elevators. Now is when things start getting weird again. Like I said before, not weird in a there's alien monsters killing everything kind of way. That's explainable. I mean weird in a Isaac, make us whole again. kind of way. This is the point when Isaac starts hearing whispers from the walls. The monitors are displaying symbols that aren't explained how they could possibly be there. Everything around us is unexplainable. Taking the elevator all the way down, Kendra tells us that the artificial gravity plating is failing, because of course it is. Here in some kind of archives room, we can see where the gravity plates have inverted and will absolutely flatten anything that walks on it. Interestingly enough, we can watch that happen to some of these enemies. And that big thing we killed on the bridge just now, he had a friend, and he's angry. So we gotta use our stasis to keep this thing from splattering us into red graffiti. Finally, we are able to reroute power from this archive room to the ADS, which is good news. We're getting somewhere here. Back in the main atrium, we have a greeting party, however, that we need to deal with, which I just barely managed to do. Now, you may be wondering, just what are these things? What are we dealing with here? Well, luckily, Kendra has been doing a little research. Isaac, listen up. I've gone over the MedSci reports. These things are biorecombinators. They take dead tissue, absorb it, and mold it into new forms. One iteration seems to have the sole purpose of infecting corpses. The others, well, seem to be making corpses to infect. And that body tissue we keep seeing on the walls is part of it, too. I found a report that says... It's a habitat changer. So basically what we're dealing with here is reverse necrosis. This isn't zombies. These creatures are taking dead life forms and altering the genetic makeup to utilize the mass as a means of transforming it into a different life form. The name given to these creatures in an audio log found in chapter two is necromorphs. So I'll be referring to them as that from now on. Make us whole again. 
Who the hell was that? Let's find out. Oh, it's a trap. Power transfer to the ADS. Okay. Primary investigation power has been rerouted. Look, I don't know about you, but I think I'm seeing things. My head's pounding still. I don't know. Just stay sharp, okay? Anyway, that wraps up the power rerouting. Let's get back down to the lower level. Up ahead is the mining administration room, and judging by the phrase, take us, we're ready, being painted on the wall in blood, I can only imagine what's in there. More malfunctioning gravity panels and a room full of necromorphs standing between us and the control panel junction box. Fighting our way across, we are able to re- to reroute power to the ADS. We're now at full power, and the asteroid defense system is online. Except it's just sitting there, and Hammond is trying to get the automatic systems online. Until then, we have to go find the turret and manually fight off these asteroids before the ship gets ripped apart. Before that, however, it's time to upgrade our suit. Level 3. This is the iconic suit from all of the promotional material. There are more suits after this, of course, but this one is the one we always see. So I'm glad it's given to us so soon. Isaac, you're going to have to cross the ship exterior to reach the ADS cannon. Problem is, we're still getting bombarded by asteroids. Look for cover or you get torn to pieces. Brilliant. So the only way is to run across the outside of a ship being pelted with asteroids. You know, Hammond, I'm beginning to think the workload is a little uneven between us. This part forces the player to balance multiple aspects of gameplay. Oxygen management, utilization of zero-g jumps, and avoiding asteroid debris. On the other side, it's time to mount up and shoot some asteroids. Just a note, I'm playing this game on controller, but I used a mouse for this section for smoother aim. Near the end, I realized it was too easy, so I went back to controller and tried to let some hit me on purpose to raise the stakes. Eventually, Hammond gets the auto-aim working, and we're heading back to meet him on the bridge. Nice shooting, Isaac. Auto targeting is now online and clearing a path to safe orbit. As soon as we're clear, I'll engage the autopilot again. Head to the tram station, and I'll meet you there when I'm done. Finally, things are looking up. He's about to engage the autopilot, engines are stable, ADS is online, and we can huddle up until we figure out a way out of this mess. Wait! Isaac Hammond, you're not gonna believe this. Oxygen levels are falling. Something's poisoning hydroponics air production, and whatever it is, it's filling the deck up with that organic stuff. We're not going to have any air to breathe soon. But if I understand these lab reports correctly, I think I can make a poison to destroy it. Head to medical. It should have everything you need. Will this never end? Isaac, get to medical and mix together whatever Kendra's come up with. I'm heading to hydroponics. If I can slow it down, that might keep us breathing long enough to fight it. Okay, so we're heading back to the medical deck. We've already been there, so it's cleared out, and this should be easy. Okay, like I was saying, we're headed back to the place we were back in Chapter 2. We've already cleared everything out there and opened all the doors, so it should be easy enough. these open with someone talk there it is Isaac I can smell the contaminated air from here it's spreading faster than I expected I'm trying to isolate it but it's not gonna buy us much time we have to get that thing off this ship the chemicals you need are in the chemistry lab I'll hack the door for you when you get there all right so let's get to the chem lab and get this concoction mixed Seems there's still a few survivors, and this one does not seem to be on our side. He's locked us out of every door we previously secured. Kendra manages to get one of the doors open for us, and we start retreading old ground. Pretty much the same thing we've seen before in Chapter 2. Okay, that one's new. 
So there is something causing the air supply in the ship to be poisoned and unbreathable. Some kind of organic growth in the ship. Which is why we need to hit up the chemical research lab, mix a few things together, and kill whatever this is. There are some questions coming up now, though. What is this growth? Is it alien? What's the writing all over these walls? Who was that survivor who contacted us? What are you doing? Please remove the Your fight for a survival is admirable, but pointless. Uh, and yet you keep on going. It almost makes me think that we had hope as a species. Am we the only one who sees that we have died out a long time ago? We just haven't accepted it yet. Stop running. Stop your struggle. Our future, your future, the future of our race ends here. Allow me to introduce you to humanity's child, the children that will replace us. Our greatest creation. So this thing can't be killed. Cut off its limbs, they regrow. Nothing you do stops it. All you can hope for is to slow it down. And it will be chasing us for the remainder of this chapter. Nevertheless, we've got the first ingredient for our poison. Time to find the second one. Your persistence surprises me. Holding on to your final breath, you claw your way along. You hold on to what was once no more. But now, Belongs to the children. Be glad of the knowledge that your death will break their birth. Listen. Can you hear it? It's coming. Say your prayers. Ah, I see what's going on here. This guy is a religious zealot, and he's decided that it is in our best interest as a species to be wiped out and replaced by whatever these aliens are. To that end, he is aided in their quest by creating this thing with regenerative abilities, which places Isaac in a very precarious situation. If we can just get to the intensive care unit, we can get that last ingredient, get it mixed, and put this place behind us. So much for Mercer's surprise at our desire to survive as a species, every survivor I've come across has utterly given up or been psychotic. Well, here's Dr. Mercer's office. An audio log explains that he really is a zealot, and that this artifact they uncovered on the planet's surface is of some kind of religious significance to his religion called Unitology. By this point in the game, this marker, as they call it, has been mentioned several times. We haven't seen it. But it is important and is somehow related to the spread of whatever is happening here. Mercer seems to think it's the answer to the next step in human evolution. Doesn't matter, we got what we needed, let's get moving. That's it, Isaac. Now you just need to- This has gone far enough. Accept your part in the God's plan. Embrace your own extinction. Isaac, he's decompressed the entire deck and I'm being locked out of those systems. All the air has been vented into space. You should be able to bring it back online from the security station, but you don't have much time. Yeah, not much time. Roughly less than 60 seconds to be specific. Without oxygen, we're a minute away from suffocation at all times. Relying on oxygen stations and canned oxygen refills to get past several rooms of necromorphs between us and getting the oxygen back online, including the regenerator, which seems somehow angrier now than it was before. Finally! But the oxygen restoration is a small victory. The air itself is still being poisoned by- I've got more intel on the atmosphere. A survivor's report says the massive creature entered the hydroponic deck from outside the ship. That's when the air quality began degrading. The survivor called it 
the Leviathan. Great. That doesn't sound menacing at all. Doesn't matter. We're nearly there. I'm beginning to truly admire your spirit. He's getting on my nerves. As it may be. I think I think you should see the whole plan. You should not spurn the hive mind's offerings. You deserve to witness that at least. But at least we can put this place behind us. Perhaps now you would understand. These specimens will return to Earth with me. I will spread their divine glory across the entire world. I will leave you with my creation. Embrace the inevitable. This thing is back, but since we're in a cryogenic storage, we have the chance to finish this. We may not be able to kill it, but we can freeze it and stuff it in a tube. Which is exactly what we do. Luckily, this exits out to a different tram boarding area and Kendra was nice enough to call it over to us. We're making good headway. Now that we've got the poison we need, we need to get to hydroponics and kill whatever the hell the Leviathan is. This is the halfway point in the game. Each chapter is an average of 45 minutes to play through, give or take 10. This one though took me well over an hour, and for a good reason which we're going to get to. Man, what a way to go, with your body stacked up in a pile in the entrance of the bathroom stalls. The story so far has offered a lot of questions, but has been sparse with his answers. The picture is starting to clear, however. While mining the planet below, they found something. Some kind of artifact, something they call the Marker. An in-universe religion believes this artifact is the key to unlocking their salvation via the emergence of this new alien life that's transforming the humans here. Whoa there, yeah, Hammond. Isaac. Good to see you in one piece. Don't take your helmet off. The head's rotten. I gotta look at it. It's huge. You won't believe it. Shut itself in food storage. Crew that was on this deck. I think they're what's poisoning the air. They've been transformed. I saw one of them. Bloated, swollen. They're like poison factories. We need to take them out where we can still breathe. <clears throat> Hammond! I thought you were dead. You need to get to cleaner air. You're not going to be able to help Isaac in your condition. <clears throat> Isaac! <clears throat> I'm scanning the area now. He's right, there's something really big in food storage. But I can't get a good scan. Monitor readings are off the scale. Be careful. Essentially, what we're looking at here is rapidly deteriorating air quality. Whatever is causing it needs to be killed and removed, or our chances of escaping are going to die real fast. The design of this whole area is really cool. Notice how they have these plants growing to help provide the ship with clean air? Would have loved to meet the team who put this much thought into making this ship a believable environment to exist within. This stuff gets overlooked so often, even in sci-fi movies and stuff. Oh, look at this thing. This is why you shouldn't smoke, kids. So, these are the things poisoning the air. And it's pretty clear now, whatever this alien life is, it's sentient and it is purposely finding ways to kill everything on this ship that isn't one of them. Since they don't fight each other, we know they are aware of themselves and direct attacks towards humans specifically. They set up in the hydroponics section of the ship because they know these plants are keeping the ship's oxygen clean. Past that, despite this being the longest level so far, there's not as much to say about it. There's not many interesting things going on throughout this level as we're sort of just going through this area's different rooms, clearing them out so we can locate these lung creatures and kill them. As far as interesting little events, this chapter is a little short. Okay, well, mostly short on them. The reason for this is because it's all leading up to the ending of this chapter where we encounter a boss fight with the Leviathan. Damn it. The poison wasn't strong enough. It's still alive. 
Get in there and kill it before it contaminates the entire ship. Entering zero gravity. This boss took me like 20 minutes. On normal difficulties, it's a pretty easy encounter, but on hard, it's a problem. Not because it's challenging, but because I kept running out of fucking ammo, then all I could do is wander around, look for a spare magazine I could grab, and hope it was enough. It wasn't. So I had to just get myself killed on purpose, backtrack to the store, and buy a bunch more ammo. To my surprise, this wasn't enough, I still ran out, so I died again, backtracked to the store, again, sold my fourth weapon, and filled my inventory with ammo and health. Now, I'm sure there's a better or more optimal way to kill this thing than just blasting it with pulse and plasma rounds, but that was my strategy, and it eventually worked. With the oxygen cleaned and that thing dead, we're able to head back towards the tram station, and the next step is throwing out a distress beacon and hoping someone hears it. I know I was pretty short on that chapter, but really there isn't much to talk about. There is a cool section in Zero-G where you're jumping through metal doors, but the game has basically migrated towards a more traditional gameplay loop by this point, especially in this mission. Go to a room, kill the creatures, move on. Although there is a pretty cool set piece here avoiding the flames. I don't know, this mission just kind of feels like busy work building up for the big boss battle. It's a great chapter because they're all great. But besides the boss, I always felt this was one of the weaker ones. We're halfway through the game, and we are caught up on the main story, but before I go any further on that, we need to talk about the subplot that has been going on in the background as we've been playing. I haven't been showing them, but this game is littered with all kinds of audio logs from different people on the ship. Most of them, however, are from two very specific people. Jacob Temple and Elizabeth Cross. I know, these names could not be any more on the nose. Their role in this game is small, as it should be, but incredibly important. Both of them are alive on the ship with us, and Isaac tends to be one step behind them every step of the way. The audio logs detail Jacob trying to fix the ship and failing to accomplish what Isaac inevitably ends up succeeding in doing. Jacob mentions repeatedly trying to reunite with his girlfriend Elizabeth in pretty much every log. Elizabeth herself is actually alive also, as we hear her logs on the ship as well. There is a tragic love story between these two, and this subplot is handled so subtly and beautifully in this game. As I've already said, I'll talk about the remake in its own video, and I haven't played it yet as of releasing this one, but I have seen parts of it. Let me go ahead and just say, the remake team handled this subplot with all the subtlety of a nuclear missile doused in radioactive kerosene and dropped on a gigantic X marked BOMB HERE. They made Jacob a bisexual man-slut that talks about hallucinations of his multiple previous partners, some of which are implied to have been on the ship, and forced both him and Elizabeth into far too significant of a role in the main story. In the original game, we're led to believe these characters are madly in love, because it's supposed to resemble and reflect Isaac's journey. Those two characters aren't that important, and their participation in the main plot is something of a hidden factor usually picked up on the player in a repeat playthrough. Everywhere Isaac goes, he's one step behind Jacob, and they're both chasing after a woman whom they're in love with. Imagine if Isaac was hallucinating random ex-girlfriends and past partners instead of just Nicole. It would put a sort of damper on the love story, and that's what they did with Jacob and Elizabeth's dynamic in the remake by having Jacob remark on seeing his past partners and hallucinations. Elizabeth's role matters in this game a lot, actually, but only later on if you're sharp enough to put it together. They just butchered that subtlety in the remake. Alright, rant done, I'll save the rest for the remake video, and I'm not going to bring Jacob or Elizabeth up again in this video because... It's something that you should be putting together yourself if you haven't played the remake. Let's get back to the main game. This may be our last chance of getting out of here alive, Isaac. There's an asteroid loaded up in the mining bay waiting to be smelted. If you attach the SOS beacon to it, you can launch it away from the ship to make a clean broadcast. The beacon's on the maintenance subdeck. You can launch the asteroid from the control room. Damn, the control room is locked. 
It looks like they keep an emergency access key on the processing subdeck. Couldn't be easy, could it? I don't know how much more of this I can take. Mining operations, the heart of this ship's purpose and its primary function. The goal is to find the distress beacon, take it to an asteroid suspended here in the Ishimura, attach it to said asteroid, and then send the thing out into the void. The control room to launch the asteroid, however, is locked, and the emergency key is on the processing subdeck. This level is pretty unique in its design. It feels very hot. Like, I mean, just from the design, the smoke, the vents, it looks like this whole section of the ship is just uncomfortable to be in. Well, we've got work to do, so let's call the elevator. Going down? That is like the only time in the game the secondary fire on the pulse rifle has ever worked for me. The atmosphere of this whole deck is great too. I mean, look at it. We can't get to the processing control room because there's a failsafe lockdown preventing the artificial gravity from turning on. This was triggered because there's massive chunks of rock floating around and turning on the gravity would be a safety hazard. The amount of detail in this game is crazy. That's like a real thing that would exist, and I love it. A safety feature that's designed to make sure the artificial gravity won't come on if there's big chunks of rock floating because they could kill somebody. Either way, these asteroids gotta go so we can get the gravity back online. We're not done yet though. With that situation sorted, we've gotta head back down to maintenance and, oh boy, look, more flying Eldritch horrors. Boarding this tram, we're nearly at the distress beacon. Okay, so we're reunited with our girlfriend, the whole reason Isaac even came on this mission to begin with. Somehow, she has managed to stay alive for a while and is working to help us access the room where the beacon is. Unfortunately, our alien friends are trying to kill her, so we have to keep her alive. Okay, the door's unlocked, Isaac. I can't get over to you, but I'll find a way. I love you. This will all be over soon. After we finally get the thing, it's time to go and attach the beacon to the asteroid and launch it. There's something we gotta take care of first. Alright, now we're ready for whatever comes next. Look at that, you can't deny this game manages to impress with excellent set pieces pretty much every single chapter. One major reason I think this game stood out so well as opposed to other horror games is that every level you're encountering some kind of unique and fascinating piece of equipment or really compelling part of the ship. So our plan is to jump onto that asteroid, plant the distress beacon, destroy the tethers holding it in place, and let it flow down into the abyss. Not a great plan. But it's all we got. Let's try that again. Plant the beacon, shoot the tethers, and it's away. 
The chapter takes roughly 45 minutes, but I have a lot less to say about it than some of the other chapters. It's got a lot of exploration sections, but the big notes of chapter 7 are that we finally found Nicole and we launched a distress beacon into space. That's the notes. This is because by this point in the game, it has become more about letting the player experience and utilize what they've learned while enjoying the set pieces. Now let's get out of here and head for the communications array, which is all the way back on the bridge. <laughs> Things are looking up. A military ship just shocked in. The USM Valor. I don't know what it was doing out there. It must have gotten our distress signal. We can't talk to it until the comms array is fixed. I'm gonna hack the door to communications for you. Get in there and find the comms control station. Okay, we have a small bit of good news. Wow, a military vessel just showed up. This could be our ticket out of here. Of course, we have a problem. The communications array is completely fried. Our best bet of escape is floating out there and we have no way of contacting it. By this point, you surely know what that means. Isaac has to find the thing and fix it. Luckily, a lot of the bridge is already cleaned out from our last time here. We may have killed the Leviathan, but this growth still seems to be taking over the ship. Well, so far we haven't- Oh, come on! Well, we're back on the elevator, and we get to see some familiar sights. Except that wasn't here last time. Something once again to note about the pacing of these levels is that they remain consistently filled with weird, horrific instances around every corner. I mentioned this before, but again, I mean literally every corner. And this scene can just speak for itself. What may have seemed at first to be a complicated task turns out to be a children's puzzle of plug and play power array, patent pending. We kill the things, pull the broken dishes out, put the working dishes in. This gives us access to short-range communications, which is all we need to hear the military vessel that just arrived in the solar system. This is USM Valor, widecasting on all frequencies to USG Ishimura in response to your SOS. We picked up your escape pod, number 47, and are en route to your position. This message will repeat every 30 seconds until you respond. What? Isn't that the escape pod Hammond jettisoned? One of those things was on board. No. No, this isn't going to happen. USM Valor. Come in, Valor. Our signal isn't strong enough. I'm going to open the blast doors to boost the signal. Error. Blast door blockage detected. Please contact the repair technician. Shit! Isaac! There's something big on the hull of the ship, directly above the comms array. Something organic. I don't know what it is, and I don't care. We have to get the doors open to transmit to the Valor. You should have a clear shot from ADS Cannon 48. Get to the cannon and blow it out into space. Well, Chekhov's gun turned out to be Hammond's escape pod. So we need to make our way back to the ADS cannon and kill whatever the hell is growing on the hull of the ship. Because although we can hear incoming messages, something is blocking our ability to send messages. The journey there is unusually quiet too. It's almost worse without the necromorphs constantly trying to kill you because the quiet makes you feel like they're about to the whole time. Either way, we make our way up to ADS cannon 48 and see what we're dealing with here. Ah, so it turns out there's a gigantic spider crab monster thing climbing on top of the communications array. We know the drill, fire endlessly at the gross yellow pustules until it dies.
the part here. <laughs> Isaac. <laughs> Isaac, are you there? Thank God you're all right. I've been trying to reach you. Someone's been blocking my rig signal remotely. <clears throat> A crash must have interrupted the signal block. Hammond, where have you been? <laughs> Surviving. Barely. I found some med supplies and packed myself up. Listen. I'm calling abort on the mission. Fuck the CEC and fuck the chain of command. We have to get the hell out of here. I think I've located a shuttle on the crew deck. The flight log says it needs a new singularity core, but we can probably salvage one from the Valor. I can see the tail end of it sticking out from the side of the Ishimura. I'm headed down there now to find a way inside. I'll meet you there. Hammond out. Isaac, if what he says is true about the shuttle, we might have a chance of getting out of here. Head to the cargo bay and see if you can help Hammond. In his condition, he may not last long. Find Hammond, find the Valor, find the shuttle. Isaac! Good, you made it inside. Listen, I just found the munitions log for the Valor. I don't think their presence here is a coincidence. They're not on reconnaissance, and they're not on patrol. This ship is prepped for war. They're on a seek and destroy mission. Do you hear me? Isaac, I've lost him again. No signal from Hammond's rig. Find the Singularity core and get the hell out of there. Hammond's rig is being messed with still. Maybe because of where he is on the ship, or maybe it's Mercer still trying to get us killed. Either way, what he just said advises caution. The Valor isn't here to save us, it came here ready to kill something. Possibly what's on this ship. If that's the case, however, how could they have known what's going on here? Or were they here for something else? Well, there it is. Those green orbs are a radioactive power source from one of the Valor's weapons, and due to their exposure to the current environment, the Valor's airlock has auto-sealed and won't open until we get rid of these radioactive orbs. Looks like we lucked out being so close to the hangar door. About by this point, questions should really be rising. Why is Hammond's rig being blocked? Where is Mercer right now? What is with this marker thing? Anyway, we can enter the Valor now and things are not okay here. Great, now we've got another problem. You might be thinking this is unusually late in the game to be introducing a new enemy type, but Dead Space disagrees. The infection process is doing something strange to these soldiers. They all have built-in stasis units in their body armor. The infection is merging the stasis unit into their flesh or something, making them move fast, real fast. Be careful. He is so right. These things are such a headache to deal with, man. I had been progressing through these chapters with relative ease, even on hard difficulty as I am, but the introduction of these things made everything so much harder. Mr. Clark, I need to speak with you. My name is Terence Kine, Dr. Kine. Listen to me. There isn't much time. If you really can repair the shuttle, there is a better use for it than just running away. You must understand, the forces at work here are greater than you can imagine. If you leave now, you condemn all humanity. The planet will never stop, never rest unless the marker is returned. Don't you see? The church is wrong. This is all a trap. I've seen it. Please, you must help me. Great, and we've got another psychopath doctor to add to the list. He doesn't want us to escape, he wants us to take this damn marker back to where they found it, or else apparently humanity will die. Bro, I'm just trying to get the Singularity Core and get the hell off this ship. I'll talk to you in a minute. The set pieces are less prominent in this chapter, but we do get this really sick shooting gallery in the style of Resident Evil 4. Getting good scores gives you little rewards like ammo and semiconductors to sell. I highly advise you do so because my progression without them wasn't an option. I was totally out of everything by this point. 
The inclusion gives a welcome break, too, because this whole mission is pretty much constant chaos getting into the Valor and getting back out. So I recommend this break because the chapter itself is long. If you've upgraded your stasis module so far, this is when you'll be really glad you did. From the fast monsters to this laser thing, this game is about to make your life hell if you slacked on stasis. This ship is pretty much in shambles right now, but if we can just make it to- So this part is like a crucible in itself. I died probably a dozen times trying to beat it. Even just stopped playing for the day to go do other things, I was getting so fed up. Who put this here? Thinking that was intense, let me tell you, things are about to heat up. The Singularity Core is right there, but unfortunately, it also has searing hot fire piercing out of it. So it seems we'll need to use these things for cover until we can blow out its power and get what we came for. Finally. Okay, we got what we need, and now we need to get out of here. that we leave the Valor as it literally explodes behind us. Alright, we need to make our way to the crew deck so we can get that shuttle and get the hell out of here. Exiting zero gravity. Exiting vacuum. I've located the shuttle Hammond found. <sighs> Shit. No good. That shuttle's brain dead. Someone removed the navigation cards. God knows why. There's three of them scattered around the deck. I'm downloading their locations. I can't access the doors from here, so you'll need a crew key. If you can find those parts, I think we can get that shuttle operational again. It's always something, isn't it? I bet you anything that this was that psychopathic Dr. Mercer. When I find him, I'm gonna curb stomp him until he's unrecognizable. Also, what the hell is going on here? Freshly lit candles scattered around the room, dead bodies everywhere, all of which seem to have been stabbed through the head and placed around some kind of statue. Oh, and a poster for the Callisto Protocol. Okay, so things are coming to their resolutions in this chapter. We need those nav cards to make the shuttle run, and all three of them are scattered around the crew deck in different areas. Fortunately, Kendra has the locations of all three. Unfortunately, there's probably dozens of monsters between us and them. I swear, this is all the fault of that damn doctor, and speak of the devil! What do you cling to when all must seem so utterly hopeless around you? Dr. Cross was a true believer. She had faith. And now she awaits her transformation. A rebirth. Are you ready to ascend, Mr. Temple? Of course you are. Have no fear. You will play your part soon enough. Witness the conviction of a true believer! They are ready. Take you. Embrace them! When I get my boots on that psychopath, well, remember when I stopped to talk about Jacob Temple earlier and his girlfriend Elizabeth Cross? Well, that's them. They finally found each other, and then Mercer plunged a spike into their heads. That explains all the bodies with massive holes in their heads earlier. Mercer is literally setting them up to be transformed. Oh, great.
great. Well, after getting through that, I grab one of the nav cards and start to move on, when I encounter something I've never encountered before. Literal dead space. I've played this whole game probably nearly 15 times in my life. I don't think I've ever seen that kind of thing before. Anyway... Mr. Clark, I really must speak with you. I'm very close to your position and... and I know you want to hear what I have to say. I can explain all this. So what happened? When you have the nav cards, I'll let you into the security station. We must talk. Hurry! Dude's got me doing all the hard work while he hides behind a locked door. It's a good thing Isaac clearly works out because he's carrying these people on his shoulders. The difficulty has been spiking steadily through this whole thing. I didn't really struggle with this on hard difficulty for most of my playthrough until chapter 9. But after that, it stays pretty difficult. Ammo is rare, enemies are stronger and more common, and in general, the game is... Even coming from. We're closing in on one of the nav cards now, but the problem is that it's somewhere in these crew quarters and oxygen to the whole block is out. So we've got to navigate through here while monitoring our oxygen levels and trying not to die. Honestly, I like this a lot. There's no other scenes like this in the whole game. It's sort of iconic, both gameplay wise and an aesthetic, because it even has an iced over look on everything due to the vacuum of space exposure. It's a subtle moment, and most people probably forget it's even in here, but it adds so much to the experience. Alright, we've got what we came for, now let's make our way over to the last nav card, and while we're at it, shoot some Z-Ball. That's right, our second minigame, Z-Ball, stands for Zero Gravity Basketball. Much like the shooting range, the better you do, the more prizes you get. Now, the way it works is a ball is shot out, and you have to grab it and throw it in the hoops. Shooting from a platform that's lit up gives extra points, a platform with red lights takes away points. Or you could just cheat. So Dr. Mercer is insane beyond recovery and has ensured a video of him preaching remains on loop at all times in case... Um, well, there's no one else alive besides me and he finished off everyone else a while ago, it looks like. So, I guess this is just for him to listen to. Oh, look, a survivor. <laughs> Why do they always do that? This time, there will be no escape for you, my friend. You have been most resourceful up until now, but my creation is free. Reborn in the fierce heat of life itself. Now it's time to play your part. This thing does not know when to quit. I might have to lock. Get out of there. Excellent work, Mr. Clark. Excellent work. Now, come and meet me in the executive area. The door is unlocked. Be quick. Isaac, be careful with Dr. Kine. A lot of what I've discovered so far has come from his records. This man has clearly gone insane. He might be unstable, maybe even violent. Alright, so I barely made it out with my life, and finally, you know we gotta finish out this level in style. Level 5 suit, let's go. Church! They think the marker is divine! 
but they don't know what's happened here, what's been released. Look, 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 look. Look at this. That is what we found in the core of the planet. Mercer calls it the hive mind. It's the source, controlling the necromorphs telepathically. We were so stupid! Amelia, she knew, she knew it could be stopped by returning the marker to the planet. The marker was containing it within the planet. Return the marker and seal the hive mind. Please, I'm sorry, Amelia. I bear much of the responsibility for this tragedy. Now, I must take responsibility for ending it. I atone for my sins. But you can help me. If you repair the shuttle and bring the marker back on board, we can end this forever. So this is another interesting crew block. It appears to be for the upper level officers. One of the rooms here actually belonged to Captain Benjamin Matthias. And we hear a log of him admitting this whole operation has been totally illegal from the start and that the Church of Unitology knew it the whole time. A lot is revealed about the Unitologist in this level actually, including the amount of control they possess over EarthGov and the amount of secrecy around their inner workings. Another room shows us an officer has been trying to figure out who on the ship is a Unitologist before the outbreak as he began to recognize the conspiracy. Anyway, we have our nav cards, let's get this shuttle flight ready. Firing shuttle engines. Right, I've had enough of this damn thing. If freezing you didn't work, then I'll just incinerate you instead. Hasta la vista, baby. Okay, that went well. while I start the shuttle's engines. This will make us whole again. Hurry! I'll take the shuttle up to the flight deck where the marker's being held. generator is out of the way, the shuttle is running, things are looking at- oh hell! Your time has come. No need to be frightened. No reason to fight. Many have gone before us, and now it's time for us to take the voyage together. Transcend death. The future take its course. Join me as I gaze upon the face of God. Guess that's it. Seems like we're tying up this bow. Let's get back to the hangar and meet Kind there with the shuttle. 
Mr. Clark, I'm approaching the shuttle hangar. You must, you must find your way to the cargo bay. The Markery, it's being stored in there. There's a cargo loading lift there you can use to deliver the marker up to the hangar. Please, you must help me with this. It's the only way. Okay, honestly, I'm not really sure how I feel about Kind's sentiment that returning this thing is the only way to ensure humanity's survival. Because if we just left this ship here and left this planet here, then... Well, we're doing it anyway. So, an interesting thing is that you return to most of the levels multiple times, including the first one you see, but each time you go back, new paths are accessible. It's such Kino game design, man, I'm gushing. As for this marker, apparently they're keeping it in this room. Weird to think it was so close when we first got here. But it's here, and let's finally get a look at the thing that's caused all these problems. it is whatever it is all this over that all right let's get this thing to the hangar which means literally dragging it manually how many of these damn things are on this ship well there's our ride now all we got to do is turn off the gravity and load it up first though There's always pain. All right, here we go. Let's get this done. Marker in place. We just need to restore gravity and we're good to go. It's on board. Please come and join me. Together we can stop this hive mind. We can end this nightmare at last. Sorry, Isaac. I couldn't let him go through with it. I suppose I should thank you for finding the marker. We even managed without help from the USM Valor. Thank you for helping me find him, by the way. My department's been looking for this place for a long time. See what kind didn't know was? It was the government's mess to begin with. This whole planet is one big experiment. The marker? This <laughs> divine relic? Made by man. They reverse engineered it a couple of hundred years ago from the real marker, a true alien artifact recovered on Earth. They dug it up, studied it, and they made it their own. Then they brought it to Aegis 7 and activated it. And you've seen the result. The stuff of nightmares. They sealed the system, and no one would have been the wiser. But then the CEC blunders in and starts tearing the planet apart. The experiment was still alive. Kind was right about the hive mind. The marker would contain it, but that doesn't matter now, does it? I have the marker, and this entire system can go to hell. For what it's worth, you did a great job, Isaac. See you around. Or maybe not. That bitch! Oh well, yeah, I forgot I about her. I need you to help me. Help us. Now! I'm... I'm in the flight control room. Please, Isaac, hurry. Please! I love you. Okay, so at least we still have someone on our side. Isaac? Is that really you? I never thought we'd be together again. God, I'm, 
I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry for what I did. I never wanted to hurt you. You need to get it back now, Isaac. You can pilot the shuttle remotely from here. Make us whole again. Make us whole again. She can't escape her fate. None of us can. Here it comes. Hold in front of the shuttle so we can fly down to the colony. So close, Isaac. Now go. Get on the shuttle. I'll meet you there. And that's pretty much the full thing. A lot of this chapter is dialogue and revelation. You're doing the right thing, Isaac. We're together now. The way it always should have been. I knew you'd come back for me. Nothing can stop us now. Isaac, use one of the loaders to get the marker off the shuttle. Here we are, the Aegis 7 colony. You can see that what was happening on the Ishimura was also happening here too. The whole area was built around the crater following the planet crack, and its design is minimal but practical. Our job right now is to get the marker and put it back where we got it, hopefully to quell the alien presence. But if this marker really is man-made like Kendra said, then I'm not sure why it would. Who cares, let's just drop it off, take Nicole and go home. Clearly there were a good deal of unitologists down here. There's not much to say or show about this mission, in my opinion. Not because it's bad, but because a lot of it is just moving the marker from one location to another and being stopped multiple times to kill everything in a room. It's a great progression, and it's fun to do, but there just isn't much to say. At least we don't have to deal with whatever that was. Finally, let's put this thing back where it goes. It's fucking tentacle! Thank you, Isaac. I always believed in you. I knew you'd return to me. We are whole again, Isaac. We are whole. Something doesn't seem right here. Where did she go? Emergency. Geo-orbital gravity tethers offline. Tectonic load released. Impact imminent. Wait. Evacuate this area Doesn't that mean... Oh. Yeah, that's speeding up. Time to go. Watch 
Isaac, it's me. I wish I could talk to you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry about everything. I wish I could just talk to someone. It's all falling apart here. I can't believe what's happening. It's strange. It's such a little thing. In the end, it all comes down to this one little thing. I didn't want it to end like this. I really wanted to see you again. Just once. I loved you. I always loved you. There's nothing left for Isaac, nothing left to lose. The music is pounding, the tension is rising. Something is about to happen. Final battle, the hive mind. It's about what you'd expect. Shoot the ugly yellow pustules, dodge the giant tentacles, and kill the beast. It's functional, fun, and incredibly well put together in terms of spectacle. It's not something you'll forget anytime soon after experiencing. Again, there's some clear Resident Evil 4 DNA here, which is a good thing.
Isaac, it's me. I wish I could talk to you. I'm sorry. That's Dead Space, one of the best games ever made, a true masterclass of game design. I have some minor narrative criticism, the main one being, if the marker wanted me to bring it back to the planet, why did it try to kill me so much while I was trying to put the damn thing back? Some of the weapons feel not that great to use despite cool concepts, and I encountered a few segments I think could have used some refining, but this game still holds up. I'm very interested in the remake, yes, but one of the reasons I haven't played it is simply because I love this one so much I didn't think I could give the remake a fair chance. Because it doesn't need a remake, it looks wonderful, and hell, a simple texture remaster would have made it practically feel modern. Better, even, actually. But with all that said, we've still got some things to talk about. Let's get into the oil and gears of this machine and talk about how it all works. So as much as I love Dead Space's brilliant narrative and level progression, its gameplay is also meticulously made to match that flow. So let's break down and discuss every part of how it plays because I'm going way overboard with this video. Starting with the movement. Although it's not something you really think about, the different movement mechanics in Dead Space are both complex and kind of revolutionary. Just like we talked about in the first part of the video, Dead Space took immense amounts of inspiration from Resident Evil 4, but although the two games play very similarly, there is one enormous difference that totally changes how it feels to play. You can move while shooting. The Resident Evil franchise wouldn't actually catch up to this until 2012 with the release of Resident Evil 6, and even that didn't feel half as smooth as to play Dead Space does. Being able to move while shooting offers a degree of control over your outcome that can really intensify that feeling of being backed into a corner in a way that I never really felt in Resident Evil 4 or 5. Other than that, Isaac defaults to a very natural walk cycle. I can't express how excellent this is, by the way, because his walk cycle is brisk enough to not make running feel necessary all the time. You will be walking through most of this game, which helps the immersion so much. Most games have the walk animation be something you need to go out of your way to get as the character defaults to a run. Much like Resident Evil 4, Isaac's default movement speed is a walk, but unlike Resident Evil 4, you won't spend most of the game mashing the run button. Due to the tight and claustrophobic corridors, it can often be a bad idea to run through rooms without gauging what's ahead of you. Necromorphs play dead and hide under bodies, so running around everywhere is a great way to get ambushed. This had the potential to be immensely frustrating if they'd made Isaac's walk too slow. Of course though, the developers avoided that trap by making Isaac's long strides feel like the player is closing the distance between him and his objective at an acceptable pace. All that being said, you will be mashing that run button a lot, but it will be in response to combat more often than not running from something. It feels significantly more natural and immersive this way. Of course, running won't always be an option. There's sections of this ship that have been covered by an organic growth, which is sticky and mushy. Isaac can't run in it with his heavy boots, forcing him to walk across it. Instances like this can actually be really tense as necromorphs approach you while stuck in this situation. Lastly, we need to talk about the Zero-G movement. As mentioned earlier, this is the only mainline Dead Space game to handle zero gravity in this way. I say mainline because Dead Space Mobile also features the same kind of zero-g movement, but subsequent mainline entries would abandon this mechanic in favor of free floating. As far as I can tell, the lore reason we can't do that in Dead Space 1 is because Isaac's suit is an older model and it's more primitive. In later games, the suits are newer and significantly more advanced featuring new automatic helmet tech and booster jets for zero-g movement. There are no installed booster jets built into the older suits, so his helmet is a bucket and he has to rely on gravity boots and long leaps like we see in the game. You can just 
feel the immense amount of care and thought that went into this game in every facet, even down to the movement mechanics. As for the combat mechanics, they're just as good. Although there's not as much to say, don't be fooled, they're every bit as polished and fantastic. Of course, you've got your basic attack, shooting things. Each weapon has a standard and an alternate firing mode, all of which we'll cover in a later section. When things get really bad though, Isaac can fight back with his hands and legs. Dead Space has two separate forms of melee attack. Isaac can swing whatever weapon he has around and bash whatever creature he's fighting, or he can curb stomp the life out of anything that finds itself under that boot. The effectiveness of his primary swing becomes questionable on higher difficulties because your attacks will be blocked a lot of times, but if you shoot off their arms, you may find more success. The stomp is more of a finishing blow if you're trying to conserve ammo. True to expectations, these attacks are not your first move. They're a last resort. Also in Isaac's arsenal are two mining tools that give him additional ways to defend himself and interact with the ship's environment. The first of which is called a stasis module. Now, you've seen me use it dozens of times at this point in the video, and the mechanic is self-explanatory. A blue energy projectile that slows whatever it touches down. Like bullet time, but in reverse. Instead of you speeding up, you slow the thing you're shooting down. How they achieved such a tool isn't fully explained beyond referring to it as utilizing advanced quantum physics. Then we've got our kinesis module. Again, it's self-explanatory. It utilizes an artificial gravity field to encapsulate an object and suspend it, allowing the user to move it freely. Its primary use is for miners and construction crew to handle large or heavy objects that would normally require machinery to move. The reason it could shoot objects forward is that the artificial gravity field can have its polarity reversed, causing it to force the object in the opposite direction. Like an anti-gravity gun. A similar technology was seen in Half-Life 2 several years prior. Some of you may actually remember when I did my retrospective of Star Wars Bounty Hunter, I talked about how much that game would have benefited from an in-game shop. Well, Dead Space took yet another note out of Resident Evil 4's book and added an in-game store to buy and sell items and resources. Dead Space has an inventory which you can upgrade throughout the game, but always has a limited number of spaces, so there is some survival horror around handling what to buy and sell and when to spend your money and when to save it for something else. Thankfully, the in-game shop is purely for in-universe purchases and there is no screen or menu in the game from which you can spend actual real US dollars. Because this game released with dignity before the corporeal manifestation of corporate greed called microtransactions began inflicting its sickness upon the industry at large. Speaking of upgrading your inventory, you can actually upgrade pretty much everything in this game. Your suit, stasis, kinesis, and every single weapon you ever touch all have numerous slots available for upgrades to improve various aspects of their efficiency. Like, for instance, your suit can be upgraded to increase the amount of oxygen you have, your health, and your inventory space. Your stasis can be improved to increase its duration or its quantity. Weapons can be improved to carry more ammunition or deal more damage. You get the idea. All of these things require a special type of item called a power node. Power nodes can be acquired one of two ways. You can find them scattered throughout the ship or you can buy them in the store. Only be careful of that because they're pretty costly at 10,000 credits. If this was their only use, it wouldn't really be a big deal, just an extra step to upgrading, but that isn't their only use. Power nodes are also necessary to access extra doors throughout the ship. There's one of these in almost every chapter, and in some instances, there's three to four of these doors. And it's pretty much always worth it to spend the node on the door if you're on hard like I am. So you kind of got to pick what you're going to use your power nodes for between unlocking doors or just upgrading your equipment. And even then, you've got to determine which equipment merits the power node. And a lot of times you have to spend a power node on a blank space to make a path to the upgrade you want. So there will be a lot of times when you just spent a power node and walked away with nothing so you could prep to get an upgrade later. There's not enough power nodes to upgrade even half of your available equipment in a single playthrough, so you'll have to pick what weapons matter and what parts of your suit you can risk leaving underpowered. If you're defensive and tend to like avoiding hits, you'll likely spend less on health upgrades and more on weapons or stasis upgrades. If you're a little reckless, you might know that extra health may be the difference between walking away and a game over. At least, 
this was the intended design, because in reality, I've seen pretty much everyone just default to getting a few health upgrades, a couple of stasis upgrades, and maxing out their plasma cutter with a lot of nodes and one really reliable second weapon, leaving their third and fourth weapons in their base form. Even still, the option to decide how you want to handle these things makes Dead Space feel much more like an interactive experience and less like a roller coaster you're just riding along for. Let's talk about one of the most iconic parts of this game, bar none. The suits. Dead Space comes complete with six suits to choose from in the base game and five additional suits available via DLC. The real advantage to upgrading your suits are the inventory space, extra health points, and increased damage resistance, but I think we all know the reason we're excited to upgrade our suits is for the drip. Look, they all look cool, so I'll just play a little montage that shows a few seconds of every suit. When it comes to the weapons, Dead Space has a modest selection, but pretty much all of them are great. Let's break them down here. First things first, there's really only one actual firearm in the game. The majority of your arsenal will actually be made up of mining tools, because you're on a mining vessel, and the only actual weapons they had on board the Ishimura were pulse rifles and pistols, and you never actually find any of the pistols they had on board, we only see them in other media. The first one to cover is the insanely iconic 211V Plasma Cutter. This is probably going to be your bread and butter. You can play through most of the game without it, but honestly, it's simply too good to not have. Most playthroughs I've ever seen rely on this as their main weapon and treat the other weapons as backups or scenario-specific weapons. Its alternate fire is just an adjustment of the fire shape between a vertical or a horizontal cut. The IM-822 handheld or cutter line gun is typically my second go-to, and it's a powerhouse. It wouldn't be unfair to call it a big plasma cutter, honestly, but it's only got a horizontal cut. This thing has a powerful primary fire and a devastating timed explosive from its alternative fire function. This thing saved me more than once. The line gun, like most of the weapons in Dead Space, is manufactured by Schofield Tools, which if you've been paying attention, you'll recognize as the name of the Dead Space Project lead, Glenn Schofield, a fun little in-universe easter egg. A personal favorite of mine, while admittedly not being the best choice of weapon to keep in your arsenal, is the SWS Motorized Pulse Rifle. While this thing would shred a human to pieces, it's a little less effective against these necromorphs who absorb the bullets with little trouble. If you're quick and have good aim with it, you can clip right through an arm or a leg with it, but it takes more precision. The alternative fire is so insanely cool, but so insanely useless. Lifting the weapon above his head, the three barrels adjust to point away from the rifle in each direction and spin rapidly to create a circle of gunfire around him. Unfortunately, this only actually worked one time in my playthrough for this video. Now that one time it did work, it worked so well it literally saved me from death. But I wish this thing was more effective because it's so cool. It just sucks and it's the only time the franchise ever attempts this idea. The RCDS Remote Control Disc Ripper is arguably the most ridiculous weapon in the game. Its primary function fires off a saw blade and suspends it in the air while spinning it rapidly to mine through rock and other surfaces. It utilizes the same gravity tether technology we talked about with the Kinesis module. It's hard to use, but really effective when you get used to it. The alternative fire just reverses the polarity of the blade, causing it to pierce forcefully through the air towards whatever you're aiming at. I like the idea for this weapon more than I actually like using it, to be honest. I know it's a staple of a lot of players' typical playthrough, but normally I leave this one in the shop. This thing, man, the handheld graviton accelerator, referred to in-game as simply the force gun, that reversing the polarity technique I've been talking about really comes into play with this one. 
It's simple, and its only purpose is to break big rocks and clear the way for mining purposes. The alt fire is pretty brutal though, firing a force bomb that explodes on impact with enemies or rolls around for a moment before exploding if it doesn't touch a necromorph. Something I'll say about this gun is I pretty much relied on it later in my playthrough here because once you get it upgraded, it's the closest thing you can get to a shotgun in this game. This thing, the C99 Super Collider Contact Beam, or just the contact beam, is designed to punch hard rock into a softened mineable material, or obliterate organic matter into a pasty red mist. The power of the shot depends on the length of the charge. Holding the trigger charges the shot and increases the power into a massive kinetic discharge. The alt fire is pretty cool and similar to the pulse rifle alt except in reverse. Isaac takes the rifle, slams it into the ground, and then fires. It then projects a massive kinetic energy wave that pushes the enemies away. This is sort of the power weapon of the game. Finally, the PFM-100 Hydrazine Torch Flamethrower. This one is pretty obvious, I think. Spitting out fire nearing 4,000 degrees Celsius, this thing turns whatever it touches into ashes pretty damn quick. And if you get into a tight situation, just launch the whole fuel canister into a fire grenade. As cool as it sounds, unless it's upgraded, it feels pretty useless. It ends up being super effective against the smaller leech creatures called swarmers and potentially against brutes to keep them pushed back, but less so against your more common enemies. All in all, a fantastic arsenal of mining tools and one military rifle. So far we've covered development, narrative, and gameplay. Now it's time to look at the framework with which this House of Horrors was built. Characters, settings, and lore. And none of these things are so important to the universe as the sinister arch-villains of the franchise, the Church of Unitology. This organized cult plays a central role in causing all of the problems in this franchise, but you actually see very little of them in this game. Their influence is always there, in the DNA of the Ishimura incident, but I think you only hear the word Unitology spoken like five to eight times across the whole game. They do refer to it as the church a few times as well, but for the first 75% of the game, it's pretty hard to pin down just how involved they really are. I'm trying to keep what I talk about in this video limited to what we see in Dead Space 1 specifically. There's so much I could say about the Church of Unitology, but most of that lore is from other parts of the series, like the books, movies, or sequels. The little bit we do learn about them in this game is vague by design. However, one thing is clear. They worship the Marker. Speaking of the Marker, what is that? Well, the Marker is supposedly an alien relic found on this planet. Again, there's a ton more to say about this, like, for instance, the fact that it's not the first Marker. A lot of that isn't actually in this game though, so I'm saving it for when more is revealed naturally in the later games. What you need to know is that it was unearthed by the CEC, otherwise known as the Concordance Extraction Corporation, and that the one we see is a man-made replica of the original true alien marker from a previous colony here on Aegis 7. So who is the CEC? An industrial, private sector superpower responsible for deep space mining and most known for the creation of the Planet Cracker class space vessel. They are also the employers of our lead character, Isaac Clark. We know well enough who Isaac Clark is by now. Our main protagonist and unlikely hero who traveled to the Ishimura in hopes of reuniting with his girlfriend only to end up in his own personal hell after being wrought with dementia from the marker. Yet despite being the most prominent character, he has the least to say since he's voiceless. I know a ton of people really love voiceless protagonists, and I do too when it fits. Here, however, I do find it to be one of the things that sort of damaged the immersion they worked so hard to achieve in every other way. So I'll say it now, giving him a voice in later games was the right move. It's a topic that the community has been split on for some time, but I still believe his mute reaction to these scenarios is simply more immersion breaking than if I had to hear him say a few lines. All that said, let's look at some of the other characters. Here we've got our traitor character boasting the most lines in the game by far. 
Kendra operates as our guiding voice in the headset. I believe she was designed to be kind of the Cortana-like objective or quest giver character, which makes the twist of her unlikability and eventual portrayal all the more of a twist to the average player's brain at the time. We were used to our objective givers to be the likable, mostly attractive characters that always have our back, which is why I think Kendra's design was so intentionally made to have that kind of stereotypical, very in-shape body type. We're supposed to be endeared to her at first, so that as we start to like her less and less, it feels almost confusing as she continues to be our quest giver. Until, of course, the betrayal happens, so to design her without these qualities in mind as blocky, stumpy, and clearly less likable from the start would be totally missing the point in my opinion. But who would ever do that? Easily the most likable character in the game, Zack Hammond acts more like a reflection of what the player is supposed to be feeling than our own protagonist does. He's constantly just wanting to make things work and get off the ship, which is why when things go wrong, his increasingly growing exasperation can almost reflect the player's intended feelings. His casting, portrayal, and performance cannot be outdone. He was embodied by the fantastic Peter Minza. I can't imagine a better choice for this character than the guy who screamed this is madness before being kicked into a well by Leonidas in 300. Up next, although Dead Space doesn't have one clear and distinct antagonist, Chalice Mercer is probably the closest thing to it. The marker affected everyone on board the ship, but given his already zealous devotion to the Unitologist religion, its effects sent him over the edge to the point of trying to ensure humanity's complete and total extinction in order to make way for the new necromorph lifeforms. Mercer is cold, certain, and very strong-willed. His character is a perfect contrast to the good doctor, Terence Kine. The timid doctor with a conscience, we see in the game that Dr. Kine is actually responsible for killing the ship captain, Benjamin Matthias, though he did so by accident due to Matthias' own insanity from the marker's effects. Kine feels a great deal of guilt for his involvement in the necromorph outbreak, and knows that it has everything to do with the marker they found. He believes that by returning the marker to the planet they got it from, the outbreak will be satiated and humanity can be saved. Of course, we see in the game that it's not quite that simple. Other than a log here or there, we don't even meet Kine until we're in the third act of the game, but his involvement is absolutely crucial to the narrative. His character is a red-haired ginger with blue eyes who is a little plumpy-looking and overweight portrayed by an actor with the most Scandinavian-sounding last name ever from Illinois, Keith Sarabajka. Sarabajka. I, I, I tried. Wouldn't it be super weird to recast him as a really fit, in-shape, ethnic-looking gentleman with white hair and brown eyes? Lastly, we've already talked a good bit about Nicole and her role in the game. As we know now, by the time the game starts, Nicole has already been dead for a while. Isaac does end up hallucinating her throughout the game, though. The marker tends to utilize loved ones, or people that one might be thinking about a lot or miss greatly, in order to manipulate someone into doing its bidding. Nicole is that person for Isaac. However, the game is trying to tell you she's dead the whole time. Just look at the chapter titles. Pretty much every character in this game was handled about as close as perfection can come, in my opinion. This brings us to our locations. There are only two main settings in the game, the Ishimura and the Age of Seven Colony. We've covered pretty much everything we can about the Ishimura at this point. A Planet Cracker class spaceship made and patented by the CEC for the purpose of deep space mining across the galaxy. As for the colony, we only see it at the very end of the game, but that does not mean they didn't put some work into its lore. In fact, a huge portion of the additional Dead Space media features this location. It appears in the movies, the comics, spin-off games, and more. It's a very important part of the overall universe as far as media goes. The last thing I want to cover is the different enemies we encounter throughout our experiencing of this game. There's 15 reoccurring enemy types you'll be fighting, and they're all equally as potentially deadly as the other. The Slasher is your basic necromorph, the first ones you encounter, and the more recently converted from the dead. Blades from their arms, skeletal, but still dangerous. Often you'll see tattered clothes and ripped jumpsuits indicating that they were corpses recently. 
Leapers are a bit more dangerous before you figure their flow. Not entirely sure what conversion process results in this thing, but its legs have melded together into a long tail, and its arms are strong enough for it to crawl on walls and ceilings and even jump huge distances, making their deadliest attribute their ability to close the distance between you and them. These are the most disturbing, at least to me. As we discussed earlier, this was at one time an infant. It died and became this, the Lurker. They all sport three long tentacles that are able to extend and retract at will and fire off projectiles. They can also climb on walls and ceilings. Appearing almost harmless due to their small size and ease of death, these things will drain your health insanely fast if they're able to gang up on you. Swarmers, as far as I understand, are small pieces of reanimated flesh tatters. Probably my favorite enemy design in the game, the Infector is a winged creature that can crawl and fly around. It's not very dangerous unless it grabs you, but its main threat is that it can grab corpses and turn them into necromorphs while you're not watching. Believe it or not, these two were at some point human. Though, I think we're supposed to surmise that it's more difficult for the marker to create these from a dead body. We know it often starts with them, so it accelerates the process. Appropriately called simply pregnants, these massive creatures aren't all that dangerous given their slow nature. However, often they are carrying inside of them something. Normally it's a handful of swarmers, but sometimes they have two lurkers in there, so you gotta be careful of that. This one is one of the least frequent encounters. The brute is fast, durable, and powerful. His biggest weakness is that he's not very smart, so if you shoot him enough, he'll shove his head into his arms to keep safe, which totally exposes his back, making him more bark than bite. Although it's called the Guardian, which may sound like an uplifting name, this is probably the most grotesque enemy in the game. They are entirely immobile and can't move, which might have you believe that they aren't dangerous. However, the truth is that the pods they fire out can kill you quick if you let too many of them emerge. And up close, this thing will one-shot insta-kill you via decapitation, so keep your distance. The pods aren't very common, they're just a chunk of flesh from which a single tentacle emerges to shoot a projectile at you. The Hunter is the regenerating necromorph Dr. Mercer created that gives us such a headache in the game. This thing literally cannot be killed, only slowed down. It acts as more of a mini-boss than an enemy, actually, due to its regenerating nature. It's an interesting one, and very satisfying to finally put down for good. The Weezers are the things we see in Chapter 6 corrupting the air. They're harmless except for the long-term damage of their poison emissions and are only found in Chapter 6. The Exploders are ones you need to be significantly more wary of. They're slow and only have one real attack, but that attack happens to be smashing you with an exploding pod which can really take you off guard if one gets in behind you. And be aware, they can sneak up on you if you're distracted by other enemies. Another really creepy one, and probably the enemy with the creepiest sound design, the Divider is a tall, lumbering beast that has been made up of several smaller creatures, one of which is the little head with tentacles you see attack me several times in the previous section. These things are really tough in terms of endurance, but if you can get them to split into pieces, you can take them down pretty quick. Lastly, we have the Twitchers which are soldiers that had the stasis units get mixed into their flesh, causing it to polarity reverse and make them twice as fast as opposed to slowing them down. Honestly, I probably died more to these guys than any other enemy in the game, because they can close the gap so fast, you end up missing your stasis shot and then they can just tear into you. Not to mention, they often come out when other necromorphs are already trying to kill you. One final note, most of those enemies have a secondary variation where their skin is totally black and they're significantly stronger. Those forms are dangerous. As for bosses, there are really only two real boss battles across the duration of Dead Space's campaign. I count one of the mini bosses here, however, due simply to the size of the creature and it only making one appearance in the game, unlike the other mini bosses. The first of these is the Leviathan. Found in food storage and fought in Chapter 6 of the game, it's a fairly easy boss fight but winds up being more about a test of resource longevity than skill in my opinion. 
The fact that it's done in zero G is actually really cool. I love that. It certainly feels more involved than the following big creature mini boss battle. That being the slug. Found in chapter eight, this one is mostly about aiming well on the ADS turret and killing it before it kills you. I like it, and it is really fitting for the game. I think I could see some people not liking it though due to its simplicity, but the truth is I think it's fitting. It acts more as a second encounter of the ADS turret section, but with a twist. I don't really consider this a boss battle, but again, this is the only mini boss creature that appears once in the game, and given it's the third biggest creature we fight, this felt like a better place to put it than with the enemies. Lastly, we have the final boss, the grand finale, the hive mind. The developers knew enough to ensure this was a spectacle of a boss, and it certainly is. Fighting it feels like a proper mix of both the Leviathan boss and the tentacle encounters. It demands you utilize almost every combat mechanic so far, not to mention it's the largest creature we encounter too. Lore-wise, this thing would appear to be the consciousness that's been communicating with the other necromorphs, so killing it is an absolute must if humanity is to survive. Dead Space has a deep and thought-provoking universe, and that is in no small part due to the wonderfully well-laid groundwork of this title. A cornerstone of the universe to come, Dead Space is really an exemplary work of excellence across all of its facets. So as we wrap up this lengthy video, but before we conclude, I wanted to briefly talk about some of the other media that released as companion pieces to this game. The first of which is an animated feature-length movie called Dead Space Downfall. A spectacularly animated and powerfully written movie, Downfall serves to cover the events that led up to the Ishimura incident. We see more of the colony here and even get to watch some of the things play out in real time we only saw happen in video logs during the game. Of course, the characters pretty much all die, but the movie is well worth a watch to go along with the game. It features some really cool tools that I ended up wishing were in the game, like the plasma saws and stuff. Just be warned, it's as gory, if not more so, than the game is. No holds barred kind of gore. Outside of animated media, we got another prequel in the form of the novel Dead Space Martyr. Unlike the movie prequel, which takes place just days before the game, this book shows us events hundreds of years prior. We get to read how the first marker was discovered and see the origins of the religion of Unitology, as well as an explanation of the Unitology mantra, Altman be praised. I gotta be honest, it's kinda slow, but very fascinating. If you're a bookworm, you'll likely enjoy the complexities around the story, but a casual fan of the series may prefer a synopsis or audiobook. Now the comics are more in line with the movie, but show alternate events, mostly taking place on Aegis 7 as opposed to the movie which focuses on the Ishimura. Kine plays a major role in this run, and Nicole even shows up as well. The art is brutal and borderline schizo like you'd expect from a comic run set in the Dead Space universe. Then we have the spin-off companion game, Dead Space Extraction for the Nintendo Wii. A nice little oddity that features a lot of additional story told via on-the-rails shooter gameplay. I'm mentioning it here, but saving my thoughts for later on a Retro Room video. And of course, in previous videos, this is always the section where I talk about the remaster and give my thoughts on it. However, I really have enough to say on Dead Space 2023 to justify its own video. And that's with me not having even played it yet as of writing this. So we'll save that for later as well. Let's talk about the music instead. Jason Graves was brought on board to compose the score here, and it is beyond brilliant. I'm talking genuinely some of the most fitting music you'll hear in a game. I don't want to overhype it. A lot of it's not like the best or most iconic stuff ever or anything. It's just so fitting. It meshes with the game itself. There's, there's some scores that are phenomenal, even standalone, but this one was clearly tailor-made with this experience in mind in a way that almost makes it inseparable from the game. There's one more thing we really need to talk about. Pang. What is Pang? Where is Pang? Why is there always Pang? 
Whatever it is, it's worth 30,000 credits. Okay, but seriously, this game is not only one of my favorite games of all time, but I'm willing to say that even despite its cult following and well-established reputation as one of the best horror games available, it's still underrated. Seriously, I hope that breaking it all down in this video has shown you that, and maybe perhaps convinced you to go give it a shot. I mean, it's not like it's super expensive or anything. It's more than worth your time. The only thing I hope you're left wondering is, how do you follow a game like this up? Wow, I think this has been one of my longest videos yet, which is okay because I really do love this game so much. Talking about it, experiencing it, and just really diving into this world has been such a treat, everyone. However, the length and overall quality of this video would not have been possible had it not been for a series of circumstances in my life that put me out of a job and gave me the free time to dive so deep into the channel. So I ask, if you enjoyed this video and want to support this channel for more content like this, consider becoming a member. I clearly love what I do, and making content like this is something that just feels right to me, so being able to support myself and continue to show my love of these older masterpieces would be an obligation I am more than willing to take on if you guys are here for it. I'm not active on many social media platforms except X, which you can follow me on to keep up with my day to day. Again, thank you so much, everyone. I hope I can continue to pursue these videos and do the titles I choose to cover proper justice. I hope to see you in the next video, but until then, that's all I've got for you.